this talk that I like to give, um, we used to call it how to be an overnight success in 20 years or less. <laughs> now I call it the popcorn theory of success, and you'll, you'll see what I mean uh, as I get going. I've always wanted to be a writer. And by that I mean I have always wanted to be a writer. When I was five years old, I made up my mind that that was what I wanted to do. My parents let me watch the movie The War of the Worlds, the original George Pal movie, not that Tom Cruise thing. That doesn't count. It does not exist. So why parents would let a five-year-old kid watch The War of the Worlds, we won't get into that. But I remember watching it, and my eyes were like wide. I was fascinated by this thing. The, the Martians invaded the earth and they had a heat ray and they had an energy shield and nothing could stop them. The army couldn't stop them. The air force couldn't stop them. The atomic bomb wouldn't stop them. Godzilla, could, no that was a different movie. Um, nothing would stop these things and they're leveling the cities of earth and wiping everything out. There's nothing we can do to fight them and at the end all the people are like huddling in churches and in bomb shelters and they all know they're gonna die. And then the Martian ships just sort of waver in the air and then they run out of steam and kind of crash. And the hatch opens in the bottom and this little three-fingered hand comes crawling out and it's covered with black blotches all over the place. And the Martian just curls up and dies because the Martians are so advanced they have no immunity to the common cold and so they just perish. Sorry for the spoiler, but it's been out since 1897. <laughs> well, that was it for me. I watched that and I just was, was astonished. I wanted to write stuff like that. I wanted to tell stories like that. I wanted to be a science fiction writer, but I had a problem. I was five and I didn't know how to write. So I drew pictures. I got the scrap pad of paper from next to the telephone and I drew pictures from the movie. And I laid them out on the floor and I would stop anybody that came by and I would tell them the story of the War of the Worlds because I wanted to make other people experience the story the way I did. Now, I grew up in this really, really small town in Wisconsin. It was called Franksville, Wisconsin. It had a population of 250 people and the local industry was the sauerkraut factory. That's where I grew up. It was so small, we didn't have a library at all. We had the bookmobile. And the bookmobile, for those of you who don't know, since we're in this giant library here and you're in a civilized area of the country, <laughs> the bookmobile was like a, a Winnebago full of books that would drive around to little dinky towns in Wisconsin. They would park in the, in the bank parking lot like once every three weeks. And I was this little kid and I wanted to read stories. This was when I was like six or seven years old. I'd learned how to read. And I got my little kid's library card. I borrowed a bike and I would bicycle down the county road for about a mile and a half to get to the bookmobile. And they had an entire section of kids' books there, like a shelf this wide for their entire kids' section. And I checked out the books and I read those books. And very quickly I finished every book that they had in the bookmobile in the kids section. And so after I finished reading all of those books, my mind started wandering to the adult bookstore. I mean the adult section <laughs> in the bookmobile. And there was a book, they had a section, the science fiction section. It was another, also a shelf like this wide with a bunch of books on it. And you could tell that these books were really good because they all had a little sticker on the bottom that had a rocket ship and an atom symbol around it. And I wanted to read all those books because I wanted to be a science fiction writer. I wanted to read these books. And there was a book in there called The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke. Good old 1950s space opera adventure. The Sands of Mars. And I wanted to read this book. So I went in there and I pulled out this book and I took it up to the front desk and I wanted to check out my, my copy. Now, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to tell stories. I had no interest in becoming a doctor or a surgeon or anything. But even then, at the age of like seven and a half years old, I diagnosed that that librarian suffered from acute hemorrhoids. Because when I took the book up to check it out, she looked at the book, she looked at me, she looked at my little kid's library card, and she looked at me again, she said, you can't check out this book, it's for grown-ups only. And so I had to go home without a book. And I was very upset about that. 
And my mom could see I was upset, and she said, what's, what's wrong? What's the matter? I said, well, I went to the bookmobile, and the librarian suffers from chronic hemorrhoids and wouldn't let me check out a book. So she grabbed me by the arm, put me in the front seat of the car, drove me down to the bookmobile, marched me up the rickety metal steps, and went right straight to hemorrhoid lady, and she said, you let him check out whatever book he wants to check out. He's reading. And so I got my book. But that kind of pointed out something for us, though, that, that we needed to have books in our house. We couldn't rely on the bookmobile coming around. And besides, I was going to read through those really fast anyway. So my parents found in the Sunday newspaper supplement, the parade magazine thing, they found an ad for 100 classics of English literature for $25. The Airmont Classics Library. They were little paperback books with tiny print and bad paper and awful covers. But these were the classics of English literature. And I remember the day that the UPS guy showed up with boxes. And we spent the afternoon, my parents and I spent the afternoon, opening up these boxes and pulling out books, book after book after book. And there was, there was Frankenstein and Dracula, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and the Mysterious Island, Journey to the Center of the Earth. They even had the War of the Worlds in there, the original War of the Worlds, and the Time Machine. and, and crap like Jane Austen, but I wasn't interested in anything like that. And so I pulled out all these books that these were Kevin's books. I put them all on, on my shelf and I started working my way through all those. In fact, the, the very first of our books that I had ever read was The Time Machine by H.G. Wells because it had bigger print than The War of the Worlds did, but I got to run to the other ones. So having read all that, studying story structure and everything, I figured it was time for me to write my first novel. I was eight. I went into my dad's study. My dad had his own little manual typewriter. Um, a typewriter, Brit, is like a steampunk version of a laptop. They were like, OK, OK. Some people don't know this technology. So typewriter, an old manual typewriter. My dad had a stack of bright pink scratch paper next to it. Don't ask why you would have pink scratch paper for the typewriter. But I sat down, and I rolled in a piece of paper, and I started typing. Typewriters were like, like laptops and printers put together. Okay. Um, I started typing my novel, which was called The Injection, about a mad scientist who had invented this injection that would bring anything to life. And the other scientists don't believe him, of course, so my mad scientist gets his revenge. Because even at eight years old, I understood enough about literary forms that mad scientists always get their revenge. It's a character development thing. And so he goes with his injection, he goes to the wax museum, and he brings to life all the like wax movie monsters, the, the Phantom of the Opera and the Frankenstein monster and the Wolfman and the Mummy. And then he goes to the Natural History Museum and brings to life all the dinosaur skeletons. And then he goes on the rampage because, again, I understood that mad scientists are supposed to go on the rampage. So he's leading this army of monsters, these re reanimated um, wax museum figures and dinosaur skeletons, and he's riding on the back of a triceratops skeleton, and that's still kind of cool to me, and he's riding on the back. But they're going to attack the city, but even then I also understood that every villain has to have a character flaw. And my mad scientist had his hubris. He made his mistake, and you've all probably figured out the mistake just from my summary, that this mad scientist did not remember that reanimated triceratops skeletons tend to rear up at inopportune times. And this triceratops skeleton reared up right when he was under the power lines, electrocuted my mad scientist, and killed him. And that was the end of the story. So we're in discussions with Michael Bay right now to make it into a full-fledged movie. But that was it. That was my three-page novel. I wrote it when I was eight, eight and a half. I wanted to be a writer. That just got me. I, I'm telling stories. This was my story. It had monsters in it. Everything was really cool. I wanted to be a writer, so I, I spent the next couple of years saving up my allowance. I would save up. I like, would go weeding at the bank. I'd get paid $25 to, do, to, to weed the entire bank parking lot and stuff. And I would recycle cans. I'd pick them up alongside the road, and you would re recycle them for a nickel apiece. And I'd saved up all my money so that by the time I was about 10 and a half years old, I had enough saved up that I could either buy my very own bicycle, like any normal kid, or I could buy my very own typewriter. And I wanted to be a writer, so I spent all of my money 
to buy my very own Smith Corona electric cartridge typewriter, which is what I had and I spent years typing on that thing. Then I went to high school. Um, I took a, a um, medieval history class and we, one of our assignments was we had to write a term paper. And everybody knows, I'm speaking this in college, but everybody knows term papers are boring. Nobody wants to write term papers. I don't want to write a term paper. So I, I went to the teacher and I thought, you know, if I do all my research and I do everything right, can I write a story instead of a term paper? Now, my teacher in this small town of Wisconsin, the teacher of the history class, was only the teacher of the history class was because he was a good wrestling coach and the law said that a wrestling coach had to teach at least one class. And so they made him teach the history class and he told me, I don't care. So I wrote a story and I did my research on the subject of the Black Death because, well, death. And so I did all my research, the bubonic plague in the, in the 1300s that swept all across Europe and the symptoms were, you know, you first got swellings under your arm and then you got a fever and you got sicker and sicker and finally you got blotches all over your arms, kind of like the Martians in the War of the Worlds, and then you died. So I did all my research, I found all the cures that they tried, I did everything, and then I wrote a story called Blessed Are the Pure in Heart, where it's twin brothers, uh, I think it was in, in Constantinople or something, twin brothers, um, they live with their father, they have an old family Bible that they would, they would read the Beatitudes toward each, to each other, the blessed are the pure in heart, the blessed are the, the cheesemakers, whatever, whatever else it is. Um, they would read the Beatitudes toward each other. Um, but then one of the, brother, the twin brothers gets the plague. He starts getting swellings under his arm. Father freaks out, kicks him out of the house because he doesn't want any plague in the house. Well, the good twin won't just leave his brother out to die, so he takes the family Bible, goes with his twin brother, and cares for them as they go through the streets of Constantinople, going through all the stuff that I had researched on how you would try to cure somebody of the Black Death. So first, they go to a magician who gives them an amulet that says abracadabra on it, because that's what my research said. He makes the kid march around through smoky, green smoke fires to see if it'll drive out the evil spirits. Well. That doesn't work. So then they take him to a doctor and the doctor um, bleeds the kid and he puts leeches on him and, and surprise, that doesn't work either. And his brother's getting worse and worse. The fever's getting higher. He's getting sicker and sicker. Finally, there's nothing else to do. So the twin takes him to the cathedral, have the, has the priest give him the last rites. They're in the pew in the church and um, the twin brother opens the family Bible, reads him the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, and his brother dies in his arms, and then he closes the family Bible and slips it back into his shirt right up against the swellings that have started to form there. That was my term paper, and I got an A on it. So I took it home, and I went, Mom, I got an A on my term paper. I wrote a story, I got an A on it. And she said, great, let me read it. So I gave her my story. And she went into the other room to read it, and I went off to do some things and I came back about 20 minutes later to find her sitting on the couch with my story. She looked up at me and she had tears pouring down her face. And that just floored me because I had written something that had that much of an impact on somebody. I made my mom cry which lots of teenage boys do, but not necessarily in the way that you want. So I thought, this must be a great story. I got an A on it. It made my mom cry. So I typed up a clean copy, and I mailed it off to Boys Life magazine, because that seemed like the most appropriate place to send it. I sent it there, and I got my very first form rejection slip. <laughs> the first of many. So let me, let me do a little sidetrack here for a second. We had a small town, we didn't have a library, and we also did not have a record store. And when you're like 12, 13 years old in high school, that's the time when you want to get into like loud rock music. That's the time when you want to get into music that is not your parents' country western. You want to get into stuff that will really annoy your parents because that's what kids do. We didn't have a record store though. We had the Columbia Record Club. 
which some of you might remember. Um, it came in the mail. It was like this sheet of little stamps of all these albums, and you could sign up for the club and get like 13 albums for a dollar. Um, albums are like CDs, only bigger. CDs are what went into iPods before they, just making sure everybody gets the same stuff. So I thought, I'm gonna sign up for this. I got the sheet and you look through the albums and I didn't really know what most of them were, but some of them looked like science fiction stuff. There was Alan Parsons' project, I, Robot, and Alan Parsons' project, Edgar Allan Poe, Tales of Mystery of, of, and Imagination, and Kansas, Point of No Return with a ship sailing off the edge of the world, and Styx, The Grand Illusion, and something called 2112 by a band called Rush. And there was also this thing called A Farewell to Kings by Rush with this little puppet kings next to the ruins of a castle and some other things by Rush and they all looked sort of science fiction-y anyway. And since I had 13 albums to do and I just peeled off all the stickers, I just went, oh, I'll get all the Alan Parsons project, I'll get all the Rush stuff. So I got all these albums in and I'm playing them and it is just the right stuff. I mean, 2112 has Getty Lee's wailing vocals, which have been described by critics as a man suffering from testicular torsion. Loud electric guitars, exactly the stuff that would really annoy my parents. But the stories were really cool. 2112 is about this futuristic, dystopian society where music and art and poetry, everything creative is forbidden. And this guy finds an old guitar buried in the ruins somewhere, finds it, cleans it up, figures out how to play it, and gets like really delighted by it. So he takes it in front of the priest and says, hey, look what I found, look what I can do, and he plays the music. And the priests take it and they say, this stuff is forbidden, and they smash the guitar, and he goes home and utterly dejected, and he slashes his wrists and dies. This is cool stuff when you're like, like in high school. This is not your top 40, ooh, baby, baby, my girlfriend left me songs. Because I was a nerdy kid that read comic books and I was skinny, I had thick glasses and a bad haircut and hand-me-down clothes, and I had no experience with girlfriends anyway. So why not listen to Rush? So I played all this stuff. Another one, Farewell to Kings, has a song called Cygnus X1 with this guy who builds a spaceship and goes off to explore the black hole in Cygnus X1. And the end of the album is he gets too close and he's caught in the gravity field and he gets sucked down into the gravity well and vanishes at the end as he's wailing and the guitars are going and that's the end of the album. And then Rush comes out with another album which is a sequel to that when he comes out the other end of the black hole into the universe where the Greek gods have gone and they're at war so he solves the war against the Greek gods and he becomes the, the symbol of balance. And no, this is not Ooh Baby Baby My Girlfriend Left Me songs. I was really inspired by this stuff. I loved everything that Rush did. I wrote all kinds of stories that were, that were based on their music. So, just put a pin in that for a second because I'm gonna go on to my very first actual published story. When I was a junior in high school, I actually got a story published in a Wisconsin high school writings magazine. It was for no pay, but I got published. My name was there in print. It was a story called Memorial. After a nuclear war, everything's devastated. Life is you know, wiped out. The cities are leveled. There's like radioactive clouds in the sky. There's nothing alive. And it's set at a seashore where the waves are coming in and going out. And, and there's something floating on the waves, something kind of melted and distorted. And it's floating and rolling up and something washes up onto the shore. It's this glass thing and it's partially melted and it rolls up and the radioactive clouds part for a second so the light can come down and you see that this glass thing has burnt painting on it and the painting is words and the words say coke adds life that was my story it needs a little bit of plot intricacies and character development but that was my story that was my first published thing i was a published author this was pretty cool about a year later i actually sold a story for money to a magazine. I sold it for $11.50. And I told my parents, see, I can make a living as a writer. And they said, major in something where you can get a job. So I majored in physics, no, I majored in astronomy and Russian history. It wasn't writing though. They didn't want me to major in writing. So I majored in astronomy and Russian history. 
I went to college, University of Wisconsin-Madison, took all my classes, kept writing, kept sending things out, kept getting rejected, kept trying, kept getting more rejections. And then finally, when I graduated, I sent out my resume all over the place to be a technical writer because at least I was going to be writing. And the first application I sent out was to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, large government research laboratory. And half the work that they did was for the Department of Energy. They did like nuclear weapons design and all kinds of stuff. So they flew me out and they interviewed me and I had already had you know, a dozen or so things published in little magazines. Maybe there were, I, I actually had an article published in Cat Fancy Magazine and because I wanted to write, it was anything. And I had some stories published. So I had these writing credentials and I had a degree in physics and astronomy and I had a minor in Russian history. So when they looked at, they interviewed me and they looked at my resume, they went, well, you've got writing credits so you know how to write. You've got a physics degree so you know about the science and you've got a Russian history minor and this is the height of the Cold War so the Russians are the ones that we're worried about. You're perfect. So they offered me a job right on the spot that was a starting salary that was better than my dad was making as a bank president. And they said, Yes, we knew you could do it. So I moved out to California. I kept writing. And that was when I kept going to writers' conferences. And that's where I won my first writing award that Patricia mentioned. I, I got a trophy. I was at a writers' conference. And the trophy, it's got a marble base, engraved brass plaque, pillars, a winged victory on the top of it. And the brass plaque that I won for this trophy, my first writing award, the bra brass plaque names me the writer with no future because I could produce more rejections by weight than any other writer at the entire conference. So, I was an award-winning writer now. At the time, though, I was doing all this stuff and I thought, it's about time for me to write my first novel, my first real novel, not the three-page one with the injection, to do a real novel. And as I was thinking about this novel, I had this idea to do um, sort of a futuristic murder mystery thing where it's a future where instead of building robots to do all the dirty work they just take dead bodies and jump start them and make like high-tech zombies so they go off and dig ditches and handle toxic waste and do everything so why bother building a robot you got these bodies around and my story is about this murdered man who is brought back to life unwittingly to become the servant for the guy who killed him and he starts to remember things so I'm developing this story Right around that time, Rush came out with a brand new album called Grace Under Pressure. And as I'm listening to this album, which I've got, this is the album. See, look how big the albums used to be. They're a lot. This is the album, cover by Hugh Syme. As I'm listening to this, the songs are Distant Early Warning and After Image, Red Sector A, The Body Electric, The Enemy Within, Every song seems to have something to do with the story I'm writing in this novel. So I thought, that would be kind of cool if I just made sure that I referenced every one of these songs in my novel. I like incorporated fake lyrics and made sure that every song that was on this album had a counterpart like chapter or scene in my novel. Just because I was a fanboy and doing fanboy stuff. So I wrote it and sent it around. Again, this is, I had an agent by that time. I sent it around. The agent's trying to get it published. I keep getting it rejected. Um, and I was writing other stories, working on something else. And I came back to my office one day at work, and I found a blinking light on my answering machine. It's like voicemail. Okay. Um, blinking light on my answering machine, and I played this message, and it says, Hi, Kevin, this is your agent. Good news, I've just sold your first novel, Resurrection, Inc. It's going to be a mass market original from Signet Books and their science fiction line. It's going to come out and like my brain exploded and I didn't hear anything else after that. So I did what any normal person would do. I left my office and ran screaming up and down the halls like, I sold my first novel, I sold my first novel. And then I would go office to office, all of my coworkers, who knew I was a writer, and I would go from office to office and I would say, it's, I've sold my first novel, it's gonna be from Signet Books and a mass market original science fiction line and all kinds of other stuff that I didn't remember. And I'm going office to office, this is, I'm walking on air, this is the best day of my entire life. And I thought halfway around the office, I'm like stopped and I went, hey, 
this is my first novel, but it's not going to be my last novel. I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a successful writer. I'm going to be a best-selling writer someday. I'm going to write lots of books. And my first sale is right there, on tape, recorded. The Smithsonian might want that someday. I should keep this. Yes, Cal State Fullerton should have it in their archive section. I should keep this. This is a great. And I went back to my office only to find that while I was running around like an idiot telling everybody, somebody else had called in and recorded over that message to tell me I had a photo order ready to pick up. Well, still wasn't going to mess up my day. So the book, I went through the whole process of editing it. They, the editor liked it so much, he said, well, what else have you got? And it turned out that I had written the first book of a fantasy trilogy, and I had outlined the other two. So they bought Resurrection, Inc., and then like four weeks later, they bought my entire fantasy trilogy. So in less than a month, they went from having no novels sold to four novels sold. So it was a pretty good month. And I worked through it. Um, finally, when the, when the book got published, um, I put in the acknowledgments that Resurrection, Inc. was inspired by the Rush album, Grace Under Pressure. And I thanked Neil Peart, the guy who had written all the lyrics for it, who wrote all of the lyrics for Rush, the drummer, and Getty Lee, the vocalist, and Alex Lifeson, the guitarist, for inspiring the novel. So I thanked them. I packaged up three copies of the book, and I mailed it off to Mercury Records, where it promptly vanished into the same warehouse where the Ark of the Covenant is stored. But I had sold three other novels, so I was writing book. Book two was published. I mean, my, the first book in the fantasy trilogy was published. Then I was working on the second book of the fantasy trilogy. I'm still working full time. I've got a couple of other book projects coming up. So it's going pretty well. Until I had, um, I, I think the technical term is I had a really shitty day at work. It's one of those where I got what, I mean, I was writing like chemical protective clothing handbooks and respirator safety manuals and things like that. And one of my, one of my books had just been published and it had one, a really embarrassing typo on it. They happen more often than you would think, but it's, you, you know, the author doesn't like to have his name misspelled in the title page. So that's kind of embarrassing. And my boss brought me into the office and kind of reamed me out for that. And there was another scientist who was like flying off to some lasers conference and I had to get his view graph presentation done and the photo department had screwed up everything so that they were all like misprinted so this presentation wasn't working right and the guy had to get on a plane so we're going to have to redo it all and people are going to be up late and um, something else had gotten messed up at work. And then Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine, one of the biggest magazines in our field, reviewed my second novel, tore me five new assholes, hated it, tore it to shreds. This is the first thing that I ever had reviewed in one of my major science fiction magazines, and they just hated it. So, as I said, this was a pretty shitty day. And I came home from work, got the mail, and there was like the Safeway flyers in it and some bills and some junk mail and a letter with the return address of Neil Peart. And inside was a letter, a seven-page single-spaced letter from Neil Peart, the guy who wrote Grace Under Pressure, the drummer from Rush, seven-page fan letter telling me how much he liked Resurrection, Inc. It was no longer a shitty day. <laughs> So we've been friends for about 27 years. We've corresponded. Um, I've been backstage at every concert since 1989 or something like that. So that was a good way to end the day. Then I came home. Uh, well, this, you know, years had gone by. I wrote some other books, uh, published them. I was working well with my editors, turning things in on time, building up my fan base. And I got a phone call from my editor at Bantam Books. And she said, Kevin, do you like Star Wars? And I said, well, 
yeah, of course I like Star Wars. Everybody likes Star Wars. What do you want? She said, would you like to write three sequels to it? Now, I had to think long and hard for like a nanosecond. And I said, yes, I can do that. So that's how I signed up to write the Jedi Academy trilogy, the three, three Star Wars paperbacks that I did. So I've started immediately to do my due diligence, my appropriate author research, which meant watching the movies over and over again, buying my Boba Fett action figures for artistic reference, getting Millennium Falcon toys so that I could carefully plot while I'm going <laughs> flying around, because that's how writers do their research. And I'm plotting all these, the Jedi Academy trilogy. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who worked for Dark Horse Comics. And she said, Kevin, I heard you're writing some Star Wars books. Well, we've got all these Star Wars comics, and we'd like you to write the introduction to this whole series that we have. And I went, Star Wars comics? I didn't know there were Star Wars comics. You better send me a bunch of free ones. So she sent me a bunch of free ones. And I said, yes, I could do that. I could write the introduction to them. So by reading all, it was the Dark Empire series, so reading all of these, these Star Wars comics to write the introduction while I was starting to plot my Jedi Academy trilogy, I got to know Tom Veach, the guy who wrote all the Star Wars comics. And he was just starting a brand new series called Tales of the Jedi, which was Star Wars stories set like 4,000 years before the movies, kind of the King Arthur's Jedi Knights instead of the movie Jedi Knights. And as he's plotting this, I'm plotting my Jedi Academy trilogy, and we're really hitting it off. And, and I said, you know, one of the main villains in my Jedi Academy trilogy is the evil spirit of a long-dead Dark Lord of the Sith. So how about if my long-dead Dark Lord of the Sith happened to live, say, oh, I don't know, maybe, say, like 4,000 years before the movie, like right when your stories are? And he said, great, let's do a crossover. So we ended up plotting out the Dark Lords of the Sith comic series, and, and in fact, I ended up writing 36 issues of comics for Dark Horse Comics because of that. So I'm working on these comics, and I'm also working on the Jedi Academy trilogy, and I got a phone call from the person at Lucasfilm saying, so Kevin, the Star Wars artist Ralph McQuarrie is looking to do a project. Now, for those of you who don't know, Ralph McQuarrie is, is the guy that made Star Wars look like Star Wars. He designed Darth Vader. He designed C-3PO. He designed Cloud City. He designed the Jawa Sandcrawlers. This guy made Star Wars. Um, he was getting into his 60s, and he was looking at retiring, and what he wanted to do was like a, a grand finale, big coffee table art book, art book with all of a bunch of his new paintings, his old paintings. Um, and they were, Lucasfilm was looking for some writer to write fake National Geographic articles for all the Star Wars planets. But because this was Ralph McQuarrie, he paints these giant paintings, we needed a book full of artwork. So Ralph couldn't possibly do enough stuff. So in addition to this writer having to go meet with Ralph McQuarrie at least once a month to brainstorm whatever artwork they had, this writer would have to go and spend many, many days up in the Lucasfilm art archives at Skywalker Ranch looking at drawers full of production artwork and alien sketches and things that have never been seen before to fill up the rest of this book. And because Ralph was such a good friend of George Lucas's and because this book was so important, George Lucas wanted to meet several times with this writer just to make sure everything was on track. And Kevin, would you be interested in writing this book? I said, yes, I can do that. But then I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall because there were other Star Wars writers. There was Timothy Zahn, there was Dave Wolverton, there was Kathy Tires. And I said, but, but why did you call me? Did everybody else turn you down? Did, did Tim say no? What, what's the matter? And she said, oh, no, Kevin, nothing like that whatsoever. We called you because you're the only writer within driving distance of Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> so that's how I got that job. And then I'm going up every month, sitting there in the Lucasfilm art archives with drawers and drawers full of alien sketches and you know, Chewbacca's treehouse and Yoda's outhouse and you know, all kinds of stuff that nobody's ever seen before. And I'm pulling these things out and gathering all this artwork to fill the book with. Um, and one time I'm up there and the deputy publisher of Bantam Books is sitting off in the corner meeting with the Lucasfilm person. And they're brainstorming. What they want to do is to do some short story anthologies for Star Wars. 
But they're talking about it and they thought, well, it's going to be really a problem because you got 15, 20 writers writing short stories with Luke and Han and Leia that it's going to mess up with the continuity. Who's going to watch over all that stuff? It's going to, the canon's going to get all messed up and it's just too much trouble to make it worthwhile. So I'm like pulling out, there's Chewbacca's kitchen and there's uh, Owen, Luke and Owen's uh, greenhouse on Tatooine and stuff. And I looked it up and I just went, oh, well, that's not a problem. What you do is you do an anthology of, say, the cantina scene. All those aliens that are in the cantina scene. Do the story about the band and, and why the bartender hates droids and who's that guy with the death sentence on 12 systems and all those people. Just tell their stories. They're Star Wars. Everybody knows them, but they're not going to mess up with the continuity. Just do that. And then I went back and here's another drawer and here's spaceship stuff and guns and aliens and planets and and I realized that it's dead silence on the other side of the room. I looked over there and both the Bantam guy and the Lucasfilm person, they're just staring at me. And so I said, and I can edit that for you if you like. <laughs> so that's how I got to do Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina. And about a week later, the Lucasfilm person called me up and said, Kevin, we really like that idea for the anthology you have, the, the Cantina anthology. We love that. And I said, thank you. Yeah, we, we really love it. Thank you. Do, you. do you think you could come up with another one too? Because we'd like to pitch a, a second one to Bantam at the same time. And I went, oh, well, do Tales from Jabba the Hutt's Palace. Like, what's the story of, of their band and the green dancing girl and the guy that keeps the monster down in the dungeon and all those stories and just do that book. Great, can you write up the proposal for it and we'll submit it to Bantam and see. I went, okay, but... I'm writing the Jedi Academy trilogy right now. I'm doing the Tales of the Jedi comic books. I'm doing this Ralph McQuarrie art book, and I've already started work on the Mos Eisley Cantina anthology. I'm a little busy. It's going to take me a few weeks. She said, oh, don't. there's no hurry. We just wanted to know. She called me up two days later and said, never mind. I just mentioned it to Bantam, and they bought it on the spot. But they bought two, so you have to think of a third one. <laughs> so that's how I edited Tales from Jabba's Palace and Tales of the Bounty Hunters. And those three anthologies are the three best-selling science fiction anthologies of all time. So I'm glad I was listening when I was looking at stuff. So I'm doing all this. I'm, I'm now editing three anthologies. I'm writing the comics. I'm doing the Jedi Academy trilogy. And along the line, I even did two Star Wars pop-up books and other things. And I'm in, again, at Lucas Ranch. And the Lucasfilm person said, so Kevin, we've been thinking. Do you suppose there's any young adult interest in Star Wars? And I'm like, have you seen your movies? <laughs> the Ewoks were not made for like the 40-year-old set. Well, they had had bad luck doing a different set of like kids' books for Star Wars. So they asked if I would like to write some young adult books for Star Wars. And I said, well, yes, I can do that. But my wife is actually the young adult author in the household. Can we work together on it? And they said, yes, you can do that. So they signed us up for three Young Jedi Knights books. And we turned in the very first one. And they, sent, they, they made a really strange phone call. They called us up and, and said, so, so Kevin, we, we read your first manuscript to the Young Jedi Knights. And um, it's really good. Can you do six instead of three? And those were every three months. And the six turned into 11, which then turned into 14. So we did 14 Young Jedi Knights books every three months for however many three times 14 is. Um, and, we, and a bunch of those were bestsellers and award winners. And I was doing all of the anthologies and my Jedi Academy books had come out then and the comics were still coming out. And I, was, I ended up eventually doing 54 projects for Lucasfilm. Then I got a phone call from a guy representing Chris Carter from the X-Files, who created the X-Files, saying, Kevin, Chris Carter loves your Star Wars books. Would you write X-Files books for him? Now, by now I'm sure you're trying to think about, what is Kevin calling this the popcorn theory of success for? So let me describe some things about making popcorn and how it's relevant. Now, I'm talking about old school popcorn, making it not with a bag in the microwave. I'm talking about in the pan on the stove. So there's two different ways that you can make popcorn, all right? 
You can take your pan, clean it out, make sure it's all you know, ready to go, set it dead center on the burner of your stove. Make sure it's not misaligned, dead center. And then you measure out a tablespoon of vegetable oil, and it's gotta be exactly a tablespoon. Make sure that it's perfect, and pour it just in the center of the pan, and then you swirl it around so that it is evenly, perfectly distributed on the bottom of the pan. Again, realign the pan exactly in the center of the burner, and then go to your jar of popcorn kernels, and you look through them to find the perfect popcorn kernel. Just one. Find one kernel of popcorn. That's the best one. And after you've inspected them all and chosen your one popcorn kernel, then you put it exactly in the center of that pot with the oil, and then you start warming it up. And you warm it up a little bit, but it can't be too fast. It's got to be evenly distributed. And you warm it up a little bit more and turn up the heat and turn up the heat, and you watch little shimmers in the oil and maybe a few bubbles, and you look at the kernel of popcorn, and you keep waiting, and you look at your watch, and you keep waiting, and finally, when it builds up to the right temperature, when the suspense is the greatest, and finally, when it pops, you go, fly, little kernel, fly, and you catch the one kernel, and then you set it aside, and you got to do it right now. So you go and wash out the pan, wipe it off, clean all the oil off, make sure that it's clean again, set it dead center on your burner, add the oil again, and then go find another kernel of popcorn. Well, you'll probably starve if that's how you make popcorn. Another way to make popcorn is to put oil in the pan, put a bunch of kernels in there, turn up the heat, and I guarantee you that if you wait long enough, something's going to start popping. I can't tell you which kernel's gonna pop, which direction it's going to fly, but I can tell you that if you have enough kernels and enough heat, and if you wait long enough, things will start popping. That's what happened to me in Star Wars and everything else. By being there, by being ready to do stuff, and when they offered me the project, I said, yes, I can do that. And then I did the second most important part. I actually did it. And then they kept offering me more and it kept sparking other things, and more kernels kept popping. After the, the, seven, after the Star Wars books and then the X-Files books, um, that was when I moved on to doing the Dune books with Brian Herbert, which I'll talk about at great length tomorrow. Um, I did my own big epic series, The Saga of Seven Sons, which seven volumes long is like a Game of Thrones with planets, only mine's finished. Um, I did a sequel trilogy, The Saga of Shadows, which I'm finishing the third one right now. Um, I've got a fantasy series, the Terra Incognita series. I've got this great series with, with Dan Shamble, Zombie Private Investigator. Those are really funny. Those are good. And then my friend Neil Peart from Rush contacted me a few years ago and, and said, um, so Kevin, let's talk more about steampunk, because I really like steampunk, and I've written some steampunk, so we, and he had read them. And he said, do you think it's going to be around in a few years, or is it a flash in the pan? And I said, oh, no, I think steampunk's going to be around for a long time. Well, it turned out that he was planning to do a, um, he was planning to do a concept album for the next Rush album with a steampunk fantasy story all the way through it. And he had some ideas for, for his villain, the anarchist, in a world that was all set up with the, the watchmaker who ran every, like a big brother, only steampunk version. And pirates and airships and lost cities and he had all these songs and he's he's working on this story and he wanted me to brainstorm with him because I'm the story guy so I'm talking with him on these things and he and I um, were like emailing brainstorming things back and forth and he's starting to write the songs and then my wife and I went and had lunch with him in Santa Monica at a, at a diner and he's writing all this stuff He's really getting pumped up. Now remember, this guy's been my idol since I was 12 years old. So we're having lunch with him, and he's all fired up that this is some of the best stuff they've done. He's writing the music, and he's got the story, and it's really great. It's not just going to be an album. It's going to be a Broadway musical. It's going to be a novel. It's going to be Ice Follies. Now, I'm a Rush fan, so I'm listening to all this stuff with wide eyes and grinning from ear to ear, and I'm going, yay, Ice Follies. But my wife is listening differently, and she just went, wait a minute, Neil, um, um, a novel? You said a novel? Who's going to write the novel? And he said, well, Kevin is, of course, and then Ice Follies and Broadway musicals. And so that's how I ended up writing the novel of Rush's latest album called Clockwork Angels. And this is the novel that came out. It is 
beautifully illustrated. How can I get it right? It's got. I'm gonna find it. Oops. Full color paintings all the way through it. And oops, just beautiful stuff all the way through. And these are all done by Hugh Syme, the artist who does all the Rush covers. And the interesting thing about this is that, now remember, I've had, at this point, I had like 110 novels published, 50 of them bestsellers in 30 some languages. And this was the coolest project since, since Dune that I've had. Rush is the number three best-selling group of all time. The Beatles are first, Rolling Stones are second, Rush is number three. Their album, when it came out, sold two million copies in a week. They went on a tour for two years for this album promoting it. I went to all my publishers saying, I'm going to do the novel of this. We're going to bring it out when the album comes out. It's going to sell like crazy. This is going to be great. And the response I got was, how do you do a novel about an album? Do Rush fans even read? <laughs> so we didn't go to any of my publishers. We went to this Canadian publisher who had published a bunch of Neil's uh, other books. And they did that beautiful, beautiful job, which when it came out, it hit the New York Times bestseller list immediately on Neil's 60th birthday. So I was able to text him just before he went up on stage for a concert in New Hampshire to say, not only are you an adequate drummer, you are also a New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> that book won several awards and it did so well that the publisher, ECW Press, decided to reprint my first novel, Resurrection Inc., which had been out of print for years, the one that was inspired by Rush. And so they reissued it, and they put a brand new cover on it. The cover was painted by Hugh Syme, the guy who painted the cover for Grace Under Pressure that inspired it in the first place, which is like the geekiest fanboy moment I've ever had. <laughs> so that turned out extremely well. What, what we just did, and this I'm just showing off because it just came out like two weeks ago, um, Neil and I loved this steampunk fantasy series, uh, the world so much, and the characters that um, we wrote a sequel to it, or it's a side book, sort of like a steampunk Canterbury Tales. And again, the publisher outdid themselves. They, they, this is the actual book you can buy in Barnes and Noble. This isn't some fancy collector's edition. This is the normal book, and it's got remember those when they put the end papers in them, and it's just a beautiful work of art. We were talking a little bit earlier about um, books. It's got line art, illustrations through it. It's like, it's like Canterbury Tales, so each one has a little story. And this is just the way books are supposed to look and how they're supposed to be. So I'm, I'm a very proud parent of that. Yes, ma'am? Which book are you working on now? Right now, I am working on Navigators of Dune, which is the next Dune book. We'll talk about that a little tomorrow. And, and the third book in my Saga of Shadows, which is called Eternity's Mind. So right now, simultaneously, I am editing two 700-page manuscripts. And what, with the Dune stuff, I will edit one and then send it off to Brian. So he works on it while I frantically work on a different project. Well, he went through Navigator so fast, he got it back to me before I finished my edit. So I had to stop Eternity's Mind just full stop halfway done because Navigators is like due really soon so they can bring it out next April or May. So um, I doing all, I, I think I killed off a main character on the plane coming here this morning. So I'm feeling pretty good. He was a bad guy. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about uh, keeping all these, that's a lot of different kernels in the pan and keeping everything in order while things are popping and projects are coming Multiple up personality and, disorder. <laughs> in, the, in the stamina, because you've done this, you sustained this, this effort right. over a year. So can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Well, the stamina and the productivity, I, this will sound really bad, but I don't think of anything else I'd rather do than writing. This is what I like to do. It's not like a job for me. It's if I'm, if I'm doing fun things, as in like playing card games with the in-laws, if I'm doing fun things, my brain is always going, I could be writing right now. I could be writing right now. That's what I want to do. Uh, so it's not a big deal for me to be spending lots of time writing. And my wife is a full-time writer. We both run a publishing company. We both teach writing seminars. We got, I mean, our, our life is entirely 
all day long from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. There, there is nothing that isn't connected to writing, and that's, that's we have no life. Now, I mean, there, there really is the TV shows we watch. We watch science fiction shows. We watch everything so that we can keep up to date on things. Um, that's what we do all the time, and, and I drink lots of coffee. I mean, that's just, that's what we like to, we like to do. Um, how do I keep it all straight? I mean, I work on different things at different stages so that I'll be like polishing and editing one while I'm plotting something different. So that's a whole different part of my brain. Um, and they're all, they're all mine. I mean, it's like parents with large families. How do you keep your kids straight? Sometimes you get them mixed up, but usually you punish the right one when they're supposed to. I guess. Yes. Um, where, do you, where do you get your ideas or your inspiration from? Well, the idea is if you become a member of the Science Fiction Writers of America, you can just buy this approved book of ideas, and that's where they all come from. Um, now I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll use my snotty answer. I mean, that I've always thought of how do the rest of you stop them from coming? Um, but as far as um, the inspiration and things. I, I live in Colorado and I go hiking all the time. I love being out in the mountains. I love being outside. Um, I'm not a city person at all. I mean, I, I like going to cities to see things, but then I would rather be up next to a waterfall than, than next to a, a concert or something like that. Um, I just, I, you look at people, you look at the news, you read like science magazines, everything. Your brain is in this constant what if, what if, what if, and if I, I see a, a brand new discovery in science news, my brain Im immediately goes, but what if something goes wrong? Um, I did a whole novel with Doug Beeson called Ill Wind, a uh, disaster about an oil spill, because I read after the Exxon Valdez spill that they were putting a whole bunch of bacteria on the crude oil because they hoped that the bacteria would eat all the crude oil and clean up the spill which all sounds wonderful, but what if that bacteria mutates and starts eating plastic and everything else? Well, that was a whole disaster novel that we wrote. Um, that's kind of how your brain is, you're, is wired as a writer, that you look at something and go, how can I screw that up? <laughs> With great profitability sometimes, so. Yes, Brent. So, you, for your first draft, you think, right? Yes. So when you read it, you actually sit down and you, um, yeah, I didn't talk about this. Most of most of my first draft writing, I'm out hiking. I have a digital recorder, and I just I talk it. I, I dictate it instead of typing it. I've trained myself to do that for 20 some years, and that's kind of that way. I get to go hiking and writing at the same time. Um, then I have somebody transcribe it, and I get it all back as a word file, and that needs to be cleaned up. I'm, you know, everything needs to be cleaned up, and first drafts are first drafts. Um, what I like to do is I'll go out, I'm a morning person, I'll get up and I'll have my coffee and I'm ready to go do something. I like to get up and go out and just dictate chapters. Well, I'll do two or three chapters in a morning, and a chapter is maybe five pages, so that's writing, say, 15 pages in a day. So I'll go out in the morning, I'll dictate chapters, and I'll be back home by lunchtime, and then the whole afternoon is spent doing email and interviews and then editing stuff. And I'm usually editing a completely different book from the one that I'm writing. Um, although sometimes I try to catch up, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, that's the hard part. To me, writing the first draft is fun. Editing the first draft is like going through a jungle with a dull machete trying to clear a path. That I know, the fun part is making it up. And then I've got to clean up all this stuff that um, either the typist got wrong or I just like got sidetracked when I was talking so that the sentence goes on and on for three paragraphs. Um, the typist sometimes does amusing ones. I, I just had one where the typist talked about my wandering menstrual instead of minstrel. Not quite the same thing. Um, oh, and another one where this guy was, was like trying to fight his way through a crowd in, in like a comic con, trying to fight his way through the crowd. And I said something about that, that he was trying to follow the Brownian motion of the crowd, okay? The typist called it a brownie in motion. <laughs> Cute, not quite the same thing. So you gotta catch all of those things, but um, each one of my drafts, I mean each one of my books goes through about seven drafts, so I'm 
edit it start to finish, go back to page one, edit it start to finish, go back to page one, or with the stuff with Brian, I'll edit one, send it to him, he'll edit, send it back to me, I'll edit it again, send it back to him, and Navigators of Dune is now in its seventh draft going back and forth, and, and I will turn it into the editor um, probably this, this weekend, and then the editor will just say, change this or change that, we hope he doesn't say this sucks. Um, he won't say that because he gets paid when it gets turned in and he's anxious. So um, then we get feedback from the editor, then I got to rewrite it again. And you get so sick of a book by the time it comes out, you never want to read it again. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Okay, Kevin, before you dictate, do you already have everything plotted out? You know exactly how your book's going to begin and oh, yeah. exactly how it's going to end? Oh, yeah. Who the characters are, what they're okay, you do, and then you begin to dictate. Yeah. So it's not like a stream of consciousness sort of thing. Would you, would you hire a contractor to build your house if he said, I'm not going to do a blueprint, I'm just going to start putting up walls and digging holes and wiring things, and, and you know, if it doesn't work, we'll just tear down the walls, we'll dig a different hole, we'll put some more wires over there, and it'll eventually work. Uh, no, I, I want a blueprint before I write an 800-page book, especially when you're collaborating with somebody, you want to make sure that you're both working off the same certainly, blueprint. Certainly yeah. Now, I'm, I, I hate to go into dead ends. I hate to write things and then throw away 50 pages because it didn't work. I want to, you know, the old, the old adage of measure twice and cut once. I, I want to, I do a lot of thinking time before I start putting words down. Did you do that here or did you actually plot it out? Oh, I actually plot it out. I mean, it, it's, my last Seven Sons book has 138 pages in it, 138 chapters in it, and 34 viewpoint characters. And, you, you, you don't just say, I'm going to make it up as I go along. Um, no, they're, they're, each chapter, the way I do it, each chapter is like a one-liner, what, what's in the chapter. And I color code them because there's 34 different characters. So this character is green, and this one's red, and this one's blue. And, and so I can kind of see it visually and structural. But, but it's not something I teach because it's something I figured out. And it's probably unusable for somebody else. Yeah. There's a French author, Francois Maria, and he talks about when he writes, his characters kind of take over the writing. Do you ever encounter that? I mean, it sounds like not from your response to this previous question. Well, they take over when I'm plotting it. I mean, what I'm thinking about is when they take over. Not um, writing process. I mean, sometimes. I mean, but I, I try to get to know them all very well while we're basically, if you're. If you want to change things and alter things, you want to do it during the rehearsal rather than during the performance in front of everybody. So I spend a lot of time in the rehearsal until we get it just right, and then we do it the, on stage for everybody else. Maybe it was just too much of a stretch of the... Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the blueprint isn't like you can never change anything, but if I do my work well enough in advance and I develop the characters well enough and every, I mean, I work on it, work on it until it all just fits together just right. And, and it's all up here in my head, and then I can just, that's why I can write so fast is because I've already got all the work done when I'm doing the writing. It's still fun. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between writing on your own versus collaborative writing? Well, each collaboration is different. I mean, it's, it's effectively like a marriage. I mean, you're there like constantly, you're in each other's head, you're in each other's story, you're, you're doing all kinds of stuff. And um, I'm very careful about who I pick as, as collaborators. And, and I've had people who have lost entire friendships because they did collaborations and they just couldn't get along. Um, I've been a lot more successful than that. but. Um, there's a lot of compromise goes on when you're collaborating. I mean, you, you, Brian and I, for instance, spend days just brainstorming and talking out the story, and we outline it so that we know he's going to write these chapters and I'm going to write these chapters, and we develop the characters together. So we have a pretty clear idea so that we both, we both see the same movie in our head before we go off to write it. But even still, when I get his chapters back, and I'm assuming when he gets my chapters back, I read it and go, oh, that's not the approach that I would have taken at all. Um, but it's half his book and half mine, so I have to accept what he does, and we, we work it out so that it, it fits together. Um, when I'm writing my own book, I can do whatever I want. I mean, I, I can make it all up, but the reason you have a collaborator 
is to get somebody who has a skill set that you don't have. Uh, it's a bunch of my books I did with Doug Beeson, the, the ill wind, the, the petroleum plague thing that I did. Uh, I collaborated with him because he, uh, he's a PhD physicist. He's worked on a bunch of that stuff. He's worked in the president's science office. He was a colonel in the Air Force, and there was a whole bunch of like geopolitical stuff that we did. I couldn't have written that book by myself, but I could write it with Doug, so that's why we worked together. Um, for Brian Herbert, in addition to him being Frank Herbert's son, his degree is in comparative philosophy and, and uh, comparative re religions and philosophy and all kinds of stuff that Dune needs to have in it. But my background's in physics and astronomy and Russian history, so that's a whole different thing. And when he writes stuff, he adds a texture to it that I can't add to it. So if I can do it myself, I'll do it myself. I mean, it really, don't kid yourself. A collaboration doesn't mean it's half the work. It's still, each person does probably 90% of the work. Um, so it is harder, but, but the result that you get is different from what you could have bef otherwise. And you split the money too, so. All right, I think I've stunned you all for the time being, so. All right, well, thank you very much for giving up some time in the afternoon and for coming out to see me, and um, hope you found it entertaining. And tomorrow it's at 11 a.m. I'll be doing one about Dune. I'm sorry? That place. The place where somebody will just bring me tomorrow, so I don't know where it is. All right, thank you.